Welcome to the online worship for Our Savior Lutheran Church. My name is Mark and I'm the pastor here at Our Savior in Kansas City. Delighted that you're joining us to worship Jesus. In the Gospel of John, Jesus tells us that we will worship Him in spirit and in truth. So no matter when we are worshiping, no matter where we are worshiping, we get to take comfort and joy in knowing that we are worshiping Jesus together and that He is present with us and that He is giving us His gifts of grace and mercy and forgiveness. Jesus promises that when we gather in His name that He is with us. And so today we worship In His name, we gather together in spirit and in truth in the name of our God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the great joys that we have in Jesus is knowing that our sins are forgiven. And so we come before God this time in a time of confession and humility and repentance knowing that through Jesus Christ, God is merciful to us and forgives us all our sins. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
We'll grab a Bible, open up to Philippians chapter 2 as we continue studying this letter. What we're going to see is that today the Apostle Paul is going to teach us what to do, what our purpose is after we have been saved. This is one of the things that the Apostle Paul does throughout the majority of his letters, that he will tell the group of people he's writing to, this is who Jesus is, this is what Jesus has done for you, and then he begins to answer the question, so now what? Right, sometimes we ask ourselves in life that question, well now what? what? What do I do now? Sometimes it's in response to something painful, something tragic, we'll ask ourselves, what am I supposed to do now? And other times it's in response to something good. Maybe you achieve an accomplishment, you finally hit your goal that you are pressing on towards, that you are working towards, that you are putting all of your effort, all of your focus into it, and then it happens. And sometimes you can ask ask yourself this question, well, now what do I do? I was so focused on that, now that I've achieved that, What do I do next? And so what the Apostle Paul is going to do after he has taught us who Jesus is and what he has done for us, that he is the Son of God who has come to redeem us, to give us forgiveness through his life, his death, and his resurrection. That Jesus has come to give you salvation. The Apostle Paul is now going to begin to talk to us about what we do now. Now that we have heard the gospel, now that we have believed in Jesus for our salvation, what do we do now? One of the important things that Paul is going to teach us is that the gospel is not just about information. You you can Google what is the gospel and you can have the information read to you on your phone right now. But the gospel goes beyond just a set of information or facts about who Jesus is and what he did through his life, his death, and his resurrection. The gospel is also about transformation. That this good news that Jesus has lived and died for you so that your sins are forgiven, that you have salvation in his name, that that information brings about transformation, that it changes who you are. It changes your whole life. It changes how you live, how you think, how you interact with others. So the gospel is not just about information. It's about transformation. And the Apostle Paul is going to teach us, what do we do now that we have been not just told the information about the gospel, but transformed by the gospel? How do we live differently? Another way to think about it is this, that there is a purpose for your faith. A purpose that goes beyond just saying, wow, isn't it great that Jesus loves me and that I'm saved? I'm just going to wait until I go to heaven now. And in fact, there were, there were Christians way back in the time of the Apostle Paul who thought that way. And he had to write them letters to tell them that's not the right way to respond to the gospel as a Christian. That as long as you and I, as followers of Jesus, are here on this earth, that we have a purpose. And so at the end of it, what Paul tells them is you need to get to work. That your faith has a purpose. That God has a purpose for you. That he has given you faith in Jesus for a reason. And yes, part of that reason is so that you would have salvation and forgiveness of sins. But as we're going to read, it's also so that other people would know about the love of Jesus because God is working through you. So we're going to pick it up in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 13. For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. So it is God who is working 
in you. He is working in us. And this is a beautiful reminder that God is continually working in our lives, maturing us and growing us in our faith in Jesus. And then Paul says, according to his good purpose, that there is this purpose that God has for your faith, that God has for your life. And he's working in you to bring it about. There is a purpose to your faith. There is a purpose to your life. Now, the way that Paul's teaching it here, there's basically two ways to think about this that that work together, how God works in our lives and then how God works through our lives. I want you to think about it in this way, that God works in our hearts and then He works through our hands. And when Paul says that God is working both to will and to work. The word will really talks, means about our desires, our, our deepest wishes. So you can say it's, it's what I want most in my heart. That God is working in your heart to transform your whole life, to transform the way you think, the way you speak, the way you act. In Ezekiel chapter 36 God speaks through the prophet and tells us this. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. So God is giving us this promise that as He works in us, as He works on our hearts, that He gives us new hearts, hearts that are softer, hearts that are kinder, hearts that are more gentle and forgiving and grace-filled, hearts that have been totally transformed by the kindness, the mercy, and the love of God Himself. So Paul's picking up on this language saying, this is how God is working in you. He is transforming your heart so that you and I have new desires. And sometimes having the will or the desire to live differently is the hardest part. Right? You, you and I can know all the information we need to know. But until we have that new desire to live differently, to behave differently, we're never going to do it. I am not a great athlete, but I know the information of what it would take for me to be in good enough shape to do a triathlon, right? It's not a lack of information for me. I know I need to run more, eat healthier, um, do more exercise, ride a bike, swim more often. The problem is I don't want to do any of those. I don't have the desire for it. So that change is never going to happen in my life. And this is the promise of the gospel. This is why the gospel is not just about information of, oh, I know the facts about who Jesus is. I I know some of the story. It's about transformation. It's about God working in you to give you a new heart, to give you new desires so that you will, in response to His grace and kindness, want to live differently. That you will then actually want to do the things that God has called us to do. So often we we do this spiritually where we know, oh, I know the things that I'm supposed to do. And why don't you do them? Because often I, I don't want to. Don't always feel like reading the Bible, learning God's Word more deeply. Don't always want to pray about it. I want to I fix it myself. I don't want to ask God for help. Here's a hard one. I know I'm supposed to forgive. I'll forgive the people that are nice to me. But the people that have hurt me the, the most who have wounded me the most deeply. I know I'm supposed to forgive them too, but I don't want to. So you and I need 
this new heart. Because you and I need that desire, that will to do the things that God has commanded us to do. Because if it was up to me, I wouldn't do them. Because as a sinner, I'm selfish. I'm self-centered. So I don't want to forgive. I don't want to serve. I don't want to read God's words. I don't want to pray. I want to rely on myself. I don't want to rely on God. I don't want to help others. I don't want to forgive others until God comes along and works in me and gives me a new heart. Until God comes along and the gospel transforms me. And so when Paul says this, he's giving us a reminder of the gospel. That God is at work in you and me. That God is working in your life. He is working in your heart right here and right now. To give you and I a new heart. To give you a new desire. To give you a new will. To do the things that He has called us and commanded us to do. And not just to do them begrudgingly, but to have a joy in doing them. To be able to rejoice and say, this is the desire of my heart, is to serve God. This is the desire of my heart, to be obedient to God. And so Paul is teaching us, this is how God works in us. He gives us new hearts. He gives us new desires to please Him, to worship Him, to serve Him, to obey Him. And then He works through that new heart. He works through us with our hands. We often talk as Christians about being the hands and the feet of Jesus. And God is going to work through us for His purpose. Again, our faith, your faith, has a purpose. And that purpose is to make Jesus known to the world. In the Gospel of Matthew, in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says it this way. You are the light of the world. A city situated on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and puts it under a basket, but rather on a lampstand, and it gives light for all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So Paul is extending the teaching of Jesus. Jesus is teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount, that here is the purpose for your faith. That you and I would shine like a light in the world for others to see so that they will worship our Heavenly Father. So your faith is not about you. Your faith is about pointing others to Jesus. Martin Luther described it this way, he said, being a Christian is like being a beggar who found some bread and is telling all the other beggars where he found the bread. So you and I are to take this light that God has given to us, to take our faith, take the gospel that God has given to us and to shine it into the world, to share it with others so that they will also worship God. And this is why Paul says that he is at work according to his good purpose. That God is working in you. He is giving you a new heart. And then he is working through you, through your words and through your actions, through your everyday life for his good purpose. And his good purpose is that more and more people would worship Him. And so God gives us new hearts, and then He works through us. So we have the heart, and now we have the hands. In verse 14, Do everything without grumbling and arguing, 
so that you may be blameless and pure children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world by holding firm to the word of life. So do everything without grumbling and arguing. Our world, our culture right now is filled to the brim with people grumbling and complaining about everything. And our world and our culture is also filled to the brim right now with people arguing about everything. And Paul says, but you as Christians... Don't live that way. Don't behave that way anymore. Why? Because God has given you a new heart. He has transformed your whole life through the gospel, through the good news of Jesus. And Paul's saying, so you and I as Christians don't live like the rest of the world. We don't respond to current events, we don't respond to situations and circumstances the way that everybody else does. Because like Jesus said, you and I are the light of the world. We're supposed to shine through our words and through our actions in a different way that the world has never seen so that they would worship God, that they would look at us and say, you are different than everybody else. And what is different about you is your Jesus. Another way that Paul is saying it is, if you respond, think, act, and speak like everybody else, then how are they supposed to tell and know that Jesus makes a difference? So Paul says, I don't want you to live like everybody else. I want you to live like Jesus has made a difference in your life. So through your words and through your actions, you shine in the darkness. And you shine for everybody to see that there is a different way, there is a better way. It's the way of Jesus. You and I are shining in the world through our words and our actions so that people will see that Jesus does indeed make a difference, that Jesus does indeed change everything. So why am I saying we have our heart and our hands? Because Paul says, here's how you're going to make that difference, by holding on to the word of life. Another way of translating it is holding it out for everybody else to see. So that you and I, the way you and I show the world that we are different is that we hold on to the word of life. We hold on to the gospel, the message of Jesus, and we hold it out for the rest of the world to see and to hear. See, when we talk about being the hands and the feet of Jesus, it is about being hands that hold the word of God and feet that carry, like messengers, that message of life and hope and salvation to the world around us. In the book of Romans, the Apostle Paul says it this way, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So how are you and I, the hands and feet of Jesus? We hold on to the word of God, the word of life. And we bring it, we walk it into the world. We, we carry that message with us wherever 
we go so that we can always be able to share the message of life and hope that is found in Jesus. What Paul is teaching us here is, what do we do now that we've heard the gospel, we've, we've believed in Jesus? Well, he says, here's what you do. You receive a new heart. So you have new desires. And then you take that faith that God has given you and you share it with the world through your words and your actions. So this is the purpose of your faith. This is the purpose of the gospel coming into you. So it would transform your heart. It would transform your life. It would transform your words and your actions. So that as Paul says, that you would shine like stars. What a beautiful image. That you and I would shine like stars in the darkness. Because what do we all know? Well, there's grumbling, there's complaining, there's arguing, there's conflict, there's division. There's grief, there's pain, there's sorrow. There's all kinds of hurts and brokenness and conflict. It is very easy to see the darkness that is in this world. It is very easy to see the darkness that is in the life of the people around you. So our response as Christians is to shine the light of Jesus into those moments into those conversations, into those divisions, into those conflicts, into those arguments, and to show the world there is a better way. There is the way of Jesus. There is the way of forgiveness. There is the way of peace. There is the way of love that is found in Christ. So you and I, have a purpose. You and I have a purpose for our faith, for the gospel coming to us, and it's so that the gospel can go to others. Now, this doesn't always happen overnight, does it? There are times where we will be praying. We will be sharing the word with others and pleading and begging for them to turn to Jesus. And it doesn't always happen as quickly as we would like. So what can happen is that we, we can be tempted to give up. To stop shining. To, to do the opposite of what Jesus said in the Sermon Mountain. To actually hide that lamp. To cover it up. But I want to encourage you with this word from the prophet Isaiah. Where God gives us a beautiful promise a promise that should give us encouragement, to give us boldness, to give us refreshment in our purpose and in our mission of sharing the gospel with others. In Isaiah chapter 55, God says this, So my word that comes from my mouth will not return to me empty, but it will accomplish what I please and will prosper and what I send it to do. See, as you shine like stars in the universe, as you shine like that light in the darkness that glorifies God and draws people to Jesus, Paul says we, we do it by holding on to and holding out the Word of God. And God's promise is this is that His Word does not fail. His Word doesn't fail. It accomplishes what He sends it out to do, and what He sends it out to do is to transform lives 
through the sharing of the gospel of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for the grace and mercy, the salvation that you have given to us, that you give us new hearts and new desires, that you are continually at work in our lives. Jesus, work through us. Help us to be your hands and feet that bring the word of life to the world around us. Help us to be people that remember there is a purpose for our faith. And that purpose is to bring the gospel to more and more people. In your name we pray. Amen. We now join together in confessing our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, which remind us that no matter where we are in the world, we are united together as the family of God in Jesus Christ. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence He will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We now join together in prayer as the family of God, using the words that Jesus taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
as a church, our goal and our mission is to connect people to life in Jesus. We want to see more and more people living in the hope, the forgiveness, the grace of Jesus Christ and receiving that gift of eternal life that is found only in Him. And so as we work together as a church to connect people to life in Jesus, I want to thank you for your generosity, for partnering with us in that mission through your gifts and your tithes and your offerings. I invite you to give your gifts online and you can see the link on your screen now. And we want to remind you of a few words from the Apostle Paul who writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. So Paul is teaching the church, reminding us that our gifts work together, that God uses our gifts to bless others to meet their spiritual and physical needs so that more and more people come to worship and praise Him and give thanks to Him for His grace and love. Thank you for partnering with us. Thank you for working with us to see more and more people come to faith in Jesus. Thank you for joining us for worship. I pray that it was refreshing for your spirit to hear from God's word. And now as you go throughout the rest of your week, receive this blessing of our God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen.